parents met in 1987, and a year later, they were married. And a year after that, in 1989, they had me. Um, the first year of my life was characterized by what I would call a very kind of typical family setup. Um, they were <laughs> exhausted, uh, not getting a lot of sleep, dealing with colic, dealing with what I am told is a very uh, high energy, high demand toddler. Don't know where that's gone now. Um, and they were also dealing with this kind of overwhelming joy at the fact that they had brought a brand new tiny human into the world. And it's a joy that I've had the privilege of experiencing since. But 18 months into my life, uh, my mum started experiencing dizziness, and vertigo. And when she went to the doctor, she was provided with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, which was actually a diagnosis that she was given originally when she was 16 years old. But it had been kept from her, and withheld from her by her parents, my maternal grandparents. And obviously, this triggered a big wave, a shock wave through our family unit as my parents dealt with the diagnosis, their individual reactions to that diagnosis, all while still being newlywed new parents, and whilst dealing with continued input from those maternal grandparents. And this came to a head in 1993, when I was four years old, but not in the way you might expect. There was no kind of big discussion about whether they were going to separate or get divorced, but things were just gradually deteriorating. And my dad left one day for work, as he usually did, kissed me and my mum goodbye. But when he returned, me, my mum, and all of our furniture were gone from the family home. All that was left was a note on a stool that said he wasn't loving enough, wasn't caring enough, wasn't, wasn't responsible enough to be part of our lives anymore. But here's where you can send your child maintenance money. And that triggered a four-year process, two years outside of the family court, two years within the family court, with my dad and later on my stepmom on one side, and my mum and those grandparents on the other. And it was a time that was characterized by incredible acrimony, hatred, discord, principally towards my dad, who was portrayed as this deadbeat, someone who wasn't able to look after me, shouldn't be left alone with me or in charge of me, and a lot of behaviors that specifically designed to attack my relationship with him. The case ended in 1997, when I was eight years old, and I actually went to live with my dad and my stepmom and my stepsister, who I inherited as well. But the years after that, even though the case had concluded, were just, if not more so, traumatic. Because I was still left with two warring sets of families, didn't want to speak to each other, didn't want to deal with each other. I was still left in the middle with immense loyalty conflicts between two parents that I loved and wanted to be around. And I was also dealing with the fact that my mum was getting progressively terminally ill. In 2007, when I was 18, I was called to Winchester Hospital after a particularly bad infection was taking hold with my mum. And along with my uncle, who had power of attorney, we decided that that was the time to withdraw care. And then my uncle left, and I was left for uh, three days and two nights with an auntie and a carer to stay with my mum as she slowly passed away. And I remember so many things about that time, whether it was the black and white movie that was playing on a tiny hospital TV in the corner of the room, whether it was the feeling of my mum's hand clasped strongly around mine as I was squeezing back, letting her know that I was there for her, or whether it was the sound of her raspy breaths as she came towards the end. I think the thing that I remember the most, however, is the profound an all-encompassing sense of loneliness. Because the people that I wanted and the people that I needed to be there in that room were not there. And that was the direct result of the court case 
and the bitterness and the fighting that had come so many years before. And that experience is something that I still have not recovered from. Now, though elements of my story are dramatic in places, many elements are representative of the children's experience of parents who separate and divorce. And we also know that this is not an uncommon experience. And I would like the people in the room to raise their hand if they have been involved in a family breakdown in any sense or know someone who has, if you wanted to raise your hand now. Okay, that's almost everybody in the room. And that's because between 80 and 100,000 couples file for divorce in the UK every single year. We know that half of those couples will have at least one child under the age of 16, and 20% of those will have a child that's under the age of five. And yet we live in a society where divorce and separation and family breakdown is still an ugly, complicated, deeply traumatizing process. I've spent the last five years not only trying to understand my own experiences, but also working and speaking with hundreds of couples, mothers and fathers who have been through the family breakdown process. And the picture that I have gathered together is a particularly grave one. I've spoken with parents about their experiences of the family breakdown process itself, which happens for myriad reasons, but often has its root causes in poor support pre and postnatally. I've spoken with couples about their experiences of horrendous abuse, both within intact relationships, but also post-separation abuse, which covers the physical, the emotional, the financial, the coercively controlling, all of which is demonstrated past the relationship ending, even if it wasn't present when the relationship was ongoing. I've seen a huge prevalence of behaviors that are specifically targeting the relationship between the child and the other parent, what we know as parental alienation, where you're trying to sabotage that relationship the types of behaviors I experienced. We're seeing systems, particularly the family court system, that is taking people in and churning people up and spitting them out in a much worse state than when they entered. We are also seeing a distinct lack of support systems of any kind for couples going through this process. Now, the impact really cannot be understated. Speaking with men, women, and getting the experiences of their children through them, we are seeing wide-ranging and profound mental health issues, as well as things like financial decimation and, of course, exposure to harm through abuse as well. And whilst family breakdown affects everybody in the family unit, there are potentially some gendered effects as well in terms of vulnerabilities to abusive behavior, but also in terms of mental health. So, for example, in 2022, I did a large-scale project with fathers called the Lost Dads Project. And we found that 40% of fathers that were approaching a service for family breakdown has said they'd experienced suicidal thoughts in the 12 months prior to approaching. Now, if you take that percentage to the amount of fathers we have getting divorced in the UK every year, that's 11,000 men at a minimum who are actively suicidal because of their experience of family breakdown. but it doesn't have to be that way. There are many, many models around the world, particularly in Scandinavian countries, even some US states, that demonstrate that we can, if we want to, provide systems that don't leave individuals in these positions, or at least not as frequently. And the changes that we could enact in this country, for my mind, fall into four areas. The first is the practical. We need to be providing support to separating couples, and we need to be doing it early on. Now, I know some wonderful couples who've separated and have managed to have those conversations and to do so productively. But I don't know if anybody in this room has ever sat down with a divorcing couple and got them to agree on anything, let alone childcare arrangements. You know that it is quite an impossible task. And it's a task that is really unfair that we are leaving couples to do without input, without oversight, 
and without assistance. And we need to think about what those solutions might look like. I think we need community embedded support and places that people can go, but I also think we need online solutions and digital ones because we live in a digital world. And that's why I'm really proud to be part of a team that's working on developing an app that parents can use and safely populate co-parenting plans together with. We also need to cover a second area, which is emotional. I saw a quote at a conference once that said, there are no two people who it's harder to get to listen to each other than two people who once thought they could tell each other everything. And I think that really demonstrates the profoundity of the challenge and the barrier that we have in getting people to sit down who are in pain, who are hurt, who are traumatized by their breakdown process, and trying to get them to shift to logical, sensible, practical planning around their parenting. So any solution and support that we come up with needs to have an emotional or psychological clinical element to it. And that's why within our app, we are going to be looking at parents' emotional readiness to do those parenting plans and intervening with that before we ask them to do it. Because they may not be ready. The third area is legal. We do not have robust enough or routinely and correctly applied statutory guidance about what post-separation parenting even looks like. We know that responsibility for children should be 50-50, but that rarely ends up being the case. And we have no practical framework for what that looks like in terms of contact and what that looks like in terms of decision making and to actually taking care of children. And that's why I would argue that we need things like they have in some of these other countries, such as a 50-50 presumption, that we start with that as a starting point, which, as all the evidence suggests, is that it's beneficial for children, as long as there is no serious risk of harm, that they maintain a relationship with both parents. But so often we are not promoting that approach. We also need systems that don't actively traumatize or re-traumatize individuals, but that act fairly, without prejudice, and quickly in order to establish the best interests and well-being of the child, and to do that in a way that protects the child's rights, which at the moment I feel that we are not doing. The fourth and final area is around society. We need to change our fundamental thinking around the issue. And I know that when I probably asked you to put your hands up and you were either thinking about your own or others' experience, it didn't exactly fill you with a nice, loving, happy feeling, because at the moment it is still so messy, so complicated, so ugly. And that is dictated by a whole bunch of stereotypes that we have. We have stereotypes around parenting, who is the default and the primary caregiver, that actually don't represent our knowledge on how children form attachments with the people around them. We have stereotypes around breakdown itself, where we have this idea about the rules and the terms of engagement. I was actually getting my hair cut um, a few days ago. What was that? It looks great. Thank you. Um, and I was speaking to the hairdresser about doing this TED talk. And she was like, oh, that's really interesting. Again, thank you. Um, and she said, oh, yeah, when I split up with my partner, I made sure that I didn't talk negatively about their father, even though I hate the guy. <laughs> and I said, do you know what? Good on you. Because what you have done is you've protected that child from issues and information they don't need to be a part of. Because fundamentally, is that person, is your ex-partner taking care of them? Yes, putting them in danger, no, then we should leave them to it. So we need to get to a position of shared consciousness within society where we say to ourselves, yeah, family breakdown happens and it's gonna continue to happen. This is not a talk about stopping people from breaking up because sometimes it's actually the better thing to do and that's actually the best thing for children. A lot of children who are in relationships where their parents have clung on and kept together for the kids, actually report really bad outcomes. So family breakdown is going to keep happening, but it doesn't have to be the way that it has been. I've spent 
decades now, and it's a journey I'm still on, trying to understand my own experiences. And I have now paired that and filtered that through into my work and have spoken with these hundreds of couples. And fundamentally, I've realized two things. The first is that we are delivering a system, and we have for decades, that is fundamentally unfit for purpose and is broken. And it is leaving psychological wounds that last a lifetime. The second thing, there is a better way. Thank you very much. Thank you.